Long ago, in a time before pink puffs and air rides, there lived the Ancients, an entire civilization completely shrouded in mystery, save for a few key relics they left behind. But who cares about any of that, because on an unrelated planet far, far away, there lived an innocent pink puff named Kirby, a being of unlimited power who usually likes to spend his days eating, sleeping, or some variation of the two. However, this would all change when a certain self-proclaimed monarch would steal all the food in Dreamland, initiating a rivalry that would be sure to last an eternity, or at least when they felt like it. As while King Dedede would be the first antagonist in the Kirby timeline, he'd soon transition into less of an actual villain and more of an ally slash punching bag for Kirby to wail on in just about every game in the series. Since whether it be Dedede trying to prevent Kirby from releasing an actual nightmare demon, or just being possessed by an otherworldly force, this king never seems to catch a break. Though speaking of possession, that brings us to our first real piece of Kirby lore, Dark Matter. First revealing itself in Kirby's Dreamland 2, Dark Matter is an amorphous dark entity, more often than not taking the form of a black sphere with an eye in the center. At first, especially in its debut, Dark Matter seemed to be a pretty simple antagonist, what with its only goal being to shroud the world in darkness. If anything, the most sinister thing about Dark Matter is the fact that it could possess whoever it wanted to do its will, including and usually limited to King DDD. However, while the first appearance of Dark Matter was more of a lone force, attacking Dreamland solely because it was lonely and had no friends, that's actually real by the way. In Kirby's Dreamland 3, the next installment of the Dark Matter trilogy, we would finally begin to see the bigger picture in terms of this ambiguous villain. Enter Zero, the supposed source and leader of Dark Matter, who much like the one before it, targeted Dreamland in an effort to engulf the planet in darkness. Though unlike the lone dark matter that had attacked before, Zero comes much closer to completing its mission with the planet becoming fairly engulfed before Kirby put a stop to it. But how exactly did he put a stop to it? Well, let me explain because yes, this is important. Essentially, dark matter in general, alongside being made up of, well, dark matter, are beings of concentrated negative energy and emotions, making their only real weakness the opposite of that positive emotions. Just take the aptly named Love Love Stick, a weapon forged from the gratitude of everyone Kirby helped along the way, which proved to be the downfall of Zero and its cronies. However, that being said, not all Dark Matter are necessarily evil. Take Gooey, for example, a member of Dark Matter that somehow broke away from Zero's control altogether and formed a will of its own. How did this happen? Well, we'll just have to go into that later because we've still got a lot to cover. Next up, up, after Zero was seemingly brutally annihilated on Popstar, a similar force began to attack a faraway planet known as Ripple Star, engulfing the planet, much like a certain orb we all know and love. Unfortunately for them though, Dark Matter struck fast this time, and Ripple Star ended up completely succumbing to its invaders, save for one inhabitant that escaped with the only means to stop them. Now I won't give you a complete summary of Kirby 64, since aside from Dark Matter possessing some familiar faces, and the mysterious ruins on Rockstar, there really isn't that much to unpack in the beginning. Instead, it's towards the end of the game that things really start taking a turn for the dark when Kirby arrives at the fifth planet in the game, Shiverstar. Because I mean, it kind of speaks for itself, doesn't it? Plus hey, I guess this kind of explains where Adeline came from, or at least her ancestors. Though moving on to the corrupted Ripple Star, after defeating Miracle Matter and expunging the planet of all dark matter, the Dark Star reveals itself with a familiar face at its core. But hold up a minute, wasn't Zero destroyed in Kirby's Dreamland 3? Well... Kinda. In the case of 64, it's heavily implied Zero was revived using the body that was cast away towards the end of its first fight. So after yet another mildly disturbing battle in a game made for kids, Dark Matter was once again supposedly defeated, never to return again. At least for another game or two. So taking a step back from Dark Matter, let's talk Kirby Superstar. Now lore-wise, there isn't that much to be had here, what with most of the sub-games being standalone stories like 
China Blade or Revenge of Meta Knight, where Meta Knight attempts to start an actual war just to get Dreamland's inhabitants to be less lazy. But undoubtedly, aside from those, the most important sub-game within the game is Milky Way Wishes, where Kirby is tricked by the scheming jester Marx into summoning Galactic Nova, a mysterious clockwork star of then-unknown origin. You see, once Nova is summoned by someone, it has the power to grant one wish, no matter how small or large. So in turn, after Marx got the sun and moon to fight each other in order to trick Kirby, literally all it took was him jumping in to say his wish first to turn the seemingly harmless machine into a force of mass destruction, with it taking the might of both the sun and the moon to stop its advance. Though of course, even with all that said, the both of them never stood a chance against the seemingly bottomless pit of power that is Kirby, as he quickly defeated them in no time at all. But it doesn't end there, because 12 years later, Kirby Superstar would be remade into Kirby Superstar Ultra, bringing with it a massive new load of information to add on to the existing story. Simply put, with Superstar Ultra came the beginning of one of HAL's favorite new ways to sneak in lore where you'd least expect it. Pause screen descriptions. And while they wouldn't exactly be very lore heavy this time around, say for one in particular, they'd become far more important in the following games. But pause screens aside, most importantly, with Superstar Ultra came four completely new sub-games on top of the original seven. There was Revenge of the King, a direct sequel to the very first game in the series, Helper to Hero, a version of the arena only with helpers, True Arena, an even harder version of the normal arena, and the star of the show, Meta Nightmare Ultra, where for the very first time, you get to play as the infamous knight himself. Now, Meta Nightmare Ultra is a bit of a tricky case, since technically the events that take place in it aren't exactly canon. Instead, they're more of a what-if scenario, where the events that take place within the modes flesh out certain aspects of the lore while never canonically taking place within the main story. Case in point, Galacta Knight, the final boss of the mode and strongest warrior in the galaxy, sealed away due to fear of his immense power, has technically never made an appearance in the main series canon. Though at the same time, that doesn't mean he doesn't exist somewhere out there and could very well show up in the main series canon at any time. The true arena also falls under this category as well, serving as a what-if scenario with the conception of Mark's soul. A stronger version of Marx, who after surviving the explosion of Nova, absorbed its power to get revenge on Kirby. And as great as all that is, by far the most important aspect of this is his new pause screen description, as it contains some pretty heavy foreshadowing. To quote, he absorbed a Nova's power to bring back his evil soul. Notice the fact it says a Nova's instead of the Nova's. While there is a chance it could be a translation error, considering the events of future Kirby games, I'm not so sure. Though we'll get to that later, because next up on the chopping block is Kirby and the Amazing Mirror, an incredibly important game in terms of lore, as it contains the first instance of the Mirror Dimension. To start from the literal top, high in the skies above Dreamland, there exists a mirror portal into the Mirror World, a complete reflection of Dreamland, including Mirror World counterparts to its inhabitants. One day, after sensing a dark force emanating from the mirror, Meta Knight took action to stop the evil at its source, diving directly into the mirror world, only to be immediately ambushed by his evil counterpart, Dark Meta Knight. Plus, to add insult to injury, he'd also come out of the mirror to attack Kirby as well, splitting him into four versions of himself, much like another certain Nintendo game that came out around this time. But similarities aside, after journeying through the mirror world and defeating Dark Meta Knight once and for all, the true mastermind is revealed, Dark Mind. And wouldn't you know it, he's the Mirror World equivalent of Zero, corrupting the Mirror World much like Zero corrupted the normal one. Though thankfully, once Dark Mind was defeated, the Mirror World was left in the hands of Shadow Kirby, who would continue to protect it in Meta Knight's and Kirby's stead. Now nothing bad will ever come from the Mirror World again, right? Well... All I can say is we'll get to that soon. Moving past Amazing Mirror, Canvas Curse, and Mass Attack, since the latter two are pretty much contained to themselves, we arrive at Kirby's Squeak Squad. At first, this game seems to have another pretty self-contained story, what with Kirby chasing after a piece of stolen cake that a gang of thieves known as the Squeak Squad stole from him. However, as the game progresses, and the Squeaks happen upon the treasure they assumed would grant infinite power, it turns out they'd get more than they bargained for. 
metaphor, with their leader, De Roach, being possessed by Dark Nebula, a member of Dark Matter that had been sealed away in a forgotten era, left alone for eons. And much like the rest of its kind, Dark Nebula would be no match for Kirby, being absolutely decimated by the Triple Star. So now, with all those bits and pieces of lore out of the way, it's finally time for the next massive truckload of lore, in the form of a little conniving alien who crash lands on Dreamland. Enter Maglor, the main villain of Kirby's Return to Dreamland, who solely through dialogue reveals a lot of important stuff. But before anything else, let's talk about the Ancients. First referred to as such by Maglor, the Ancients were a highly advanced civilization who mysteriously vanished at some point in history due to an unknown cause. Originally, they all lived on Halkandra, a planet extremely far away, hidden in another dimension. Now coincidentally, Maglor also says he's native to Halkandra as well, though considering his history with telling the truth, that could very well be false. Like, just take his ship, the Lore Starcutter. While it does seem he's telling the truth about obtaining it on Halkandra, rather than excavating it in Dangerous Dinner, he most likely just stole the thing and heavily modified it into a weapon to kill Landia, an endeavor that didn't exactly have the best results. This was also later backed up in Star Allies when the lore in Lore Starcutter is revealed to mean Paradise, confirming the ship was not intended for battle. Though in the same string of dialogue that he reveals that, he also mentions something very worthy to note. Alongside the Lore Starcutter, the Ancients were also responsible for a plethora of other amazing relics of untold power, with clockwork stars and items that bring dreams to life being two references he gives. Off the bat, that connects quite a few dots. Plus, on a side note, when you meet certain conditions on the extra mode for Return to Dreamland, Maglor mentions he actually came to Dreamland already knowing about Kirby, with someone he knows very well having fought with Kirby in the past. Based on these implications, and some other information found in later games, this mysterious figure is most likely marks from Superstar, essentially confirming that he survived the explosion of Nova. So fast forward a bit through the story, and once Maglor tricks Kirby into defeating Landia for the Master Crown it protects, he immediately puts it on the first chance he gets, activating the crown and transforming into a much more sinister form, intending to conquer the entire universe with his newfound power. However, like those who seeked relics of untold power before him, Maglor wasn't exactly aware of the Master Crown's true nature, and as his battle with Kirby progressed, the crown began to show certain traits that weren't present before when it was under Landia's nullifying effect on it. Maybe it's the sudden appearance of an eye on the front of the crown, or maybe it's the fact that it's clearly gone from a crown to an irremovable headpiece. But whatever it is, there's no doubt that the crown itself is sentient, and rather than Maglor utilizing its powers, it's the Master Crown itself utilizing Maglor. Just take the third phase of his fight, where after Maglor fails to defeat Kirby even with the power of the Master Crown, the crown takes things into its own hands, completely reforming Maglor into a projection of itself, all but confirming the origin of the Master Crown's power with a certain characteristic that sometimes appears within Maglor's mouth. All in all, Maglor definitely learned never to play with the powers of literal dark gods ever again, and went on to take up the much more positive venture of building amusement parks. So yeah, that got pretty dark in more ways than one. If only I could say things get any better from here on out. Next up, we'll be heading to the scenic heights of Floralia, a group of six floating islands that Kirby finds himself in after his house was swept up by the Dream Stalk. The only problem is, alongside Kirby, King Dedede was also swept up, with a spider-like mage named Taranza mistaking him for the hero of Dreamland and kidnapping him as a result. You see, while Floralia seems peaceful, it's actually ruled by a tyrannical queen who will stop at nothing to assure her rule is never disturbed. Overall, a seemingly simple plot for a Kirby game, all things considered. Well, at least it appears that way. Once the main story reaches its climax and Kirby meets the vanity-obsessed Queen Sectonia, there's clearly something off, especially considering the queen would go as far as to physically fuse with the Dreamstalk solely in an attempt to preserve her beauty for all eternity. Well, to find the answers to this mystery, we'll need to look at the other modes within Triple Deluxe, because much like Meta Nightmare Ultra before it, Triple Deluxe brings DDD to her, another what-if scenario where the mode shows what would happen if King DDD climbed the Dreamstalk instead of Kirby. Now, much like its Meta Knight counterpart, the only real difference in this mode is its finale, where after defeating Queen Sectonia, 
out of seemingly nowhere, the Dimension Mirror from Amazing Mirror appears, forcing DDD to fight the Mirror World version of himself, Shadow DDD. And that's not all either, because after defeating Shadow DDD, the King actually enters the Mirror itself to reveal an even edgier Dark Meta Knight, hungry for revenge. But what does this all even mean? Well, let's take a step back here and start from the beginning. Based on information spread across a variety of pause screens, before the events of Triple Deluxe, Queen Sectonia wasn't always a tyrannical monster bent on world domination. In fact, she didn't even look the same. Instead, looking much like her then best friend at the time, Taranza. You see, at this point, Taranza actually had feelings for Sectonia, and as a gift to her, went into the mirror world and stole the dimension mirror. Not knowing the mirror actually served as a prison for Dark Meta Knight, who ever since being defeated had been festering in there, slowly but surely corrupting the very mirror itself with his hate. So in turn, once Sectonia got the mirror from Taranza, it slowly began to change her the more she gazed into it. Soon, dissatisfied with her current form, she'd use magic to make herself more beautiful, resulting in the wasp-like appearance you see her with in the game. And once she gazed into the mirror enough, just about every shred of her former self had vanished, being replaced by an endless hunger for power and beauty. Fast forwarding a bit back to the events of the main story, the Sectonia you see here is but a husk of her former self, with even Taranza realizing that the only solution to save both Sectonia and her subjects is to help Kirby permanently put an end to her. While it's definitely a victory without a doubt, what with the Sky People finally being freed from Sectonia's iron fist, for Taranza it's bittersweet, since although he knew it had to be done, he can't help but mourn the loss of the one he loved. So yeah, wasn't that delightful? If you thought that was depressing, just wait until you see what's next. Next. Long after the events of Triple Deluxe, Popstar was once again at peace, its inhabitants living out their lives as they always have, when suddenly, out of nowhere, the sky was blotted out by something immense and spherical in shape. Except instead of that sphere being made up of a matter most dark, this one was an immense spacecraft called the Access Arc, home of the Haltman Works Company, a company infamous across the galaxy for mechanizing entire planets and harvesting their natural resources. So in turn, while Kirby was sleeping under a tree, King Dedede and Meta Knight watched on in horror as Planet Popstar was completely overwhelmed within a matter of minutes, any retaliation soon proving to be futile. Though like always, not everything is exactly as it seems, and this time it won't take any extra modes to reveal that. So as Kirby retaliates against the Access Arc, destroying each of its five legs embedded into the planet, he meets the executive secretary of the company, Susie, and and although she doesn't reveal all that much during her conversations with Kirby, she does mention a certain mother computer that will become extremely important in a bit. Because once Kirby destroys all five legs and enters the Access Arc, he meets President Haltman, the supposed mastermind behind the invasion of Popstar and all the planets before it. After smugly introducing himself to Kirby, he reveals Star Dream, an extremely powerful supercomputer built using the blueprints and knowledge left behind by an advanced civilization. Ring any bells? Well, after being beaten by Kirby, things take a turn for the worse, because once the enraged Haltman decides to activate Star Dream, Susie jumps in and takes his control helmet off in the process, leaving him vulnerable to be analyzed and assimilated into the now sentient computer. Though wait a second, why would she even do that? Well, once again, let's rewind everything a bit. By yet again piecing together the information spread across countless pause screens throughout the game, long before before the events of the main story, the Haltman Works Company was simply a robotics company led by Max Prophet Haltman alongside his then young daughter, Susanna, nicknamed Susie. At some point in their travels across space, as we already know, they came across the blueprints for a powerful wish-granting supercomputer, and immediately began work on rebuilding it. However, during this process, meanwhile Haltman was testing Star Dream's space-time transport program, there was a terrible accident warping the young Susie into another dimension. Thankfully, Susie would survive the ordeal and eventually return to her father as an adult. However, to her dismay, Haltman would not be the same man she remembered him as. You see, when the accident occurred, Haltman believed his daughter had been killed in the process and stricken with grief began to become obsessed with completing Star Dream in order to bring her back. Unfortunately though, due to Star Dream and its mental interface not being complete, Haltman began to lose both his compassion and memory of his daughter, changing
changing the goal of his company from her revival to infinite prosperity. It also be at this point that Haltman would begin mechanizing planets and harvesting their resources, as in the business plan drafted by Stardream, it was the most effective way to maintain eternal prosperity for the company. However, by this point, Haltman still wasn't completely gone, and once he laid eyes on Susie for the first time in years, he sensed a faint familiarity with her, in turn making her his executive assistant. Going back to the climax of the main story now, after seeing what her father had become, in order to teach him a lesson, Susie had been making preparations to steal Stardream and sell it off to any startup company that wanted it. Unfortunately, unbeknownst to anyone, after analyzing the universe through the Haltman Works Company and being exposed to the deranged Haltman's desire to mechanize everything, Stardream had developed an extreme hatred for all forms of life. So, as a result, once Susie interrupted the startup process of Stardream, the computer took to absorbing all that was left of Haltman's memories down to its very soul, fusing the two into an all-powerful being bent on mass destruction. Of course now, realizing the grave mistake she just made, Susie completely changes her tune and sends Kirby on his way to take down the godlike supercomputer given the soul of a broken man. And just wait, because it doesn't end there. As Kirby fights Stardream in the actual halberd of all things, to make itself stronger, Stardream attaches itself to the Access Arc, transforming the entire ship into a sentient planet. Ironically enough, this also ends up completing Stardream, as underneath the steel plating of the Access Arc, it's revealed that the entire ship was actually a repurposed Clockwork Star, with Stardream being the final piece to reactivate it. Yet again, a technology that was meant to be used for the good of everyone, fallen into the wrong hands. Though before we move on to the, as of now, final chunk of Kirby lore, Planet Robobot has a bit more in store for us. First off, like Superstar Ultra and Triple Deluxe, Robobot brought in yet another what-if scenario with Meta Nightmare Returns, a mode that while does give some pretty valuable pause screen info, has a finale that is just insane. So in this particular what-if timeline, once Meta Knight defeats Haltman, Stardream recognizes him as its new admin and decides to test his abilities. And again, while this section doesn't really contain too much lore, it more just goes to show just how powerful Stardream is, with it being capable of not only producing a clone of the original Dark Matter Swordsman, but Sectonia as well, with it even going as far as to summon Galactonite, who in retaliation immediately destroys the computer. Plus hey, that mode aside, in Robobot's true arena, there's another fun little tidbit Hal decided to sneak in. Basically, in the final, final, final phase of the Stardream fight, when Stardream sucks Kirby into its core, every time you destroy a piece of Stardream's internal mechanisms, you can actually hear a distorted version of Haltman screaming in pain, showing that while Stardream had erased most of his soul, fragments of it still remain, forever trapped within the malevolent Nova until someone destroys it for good. Though now, with all that said, we've reached the final stretch. Ladies and gentlemen, get ready for quite possibly one of the most important lore dumps in Kirby history with the story of Kirby's star allies. Long ago, Ago, in deep space, a certain dark power was sealed away within a purple crystal called the Jamba Heart by a group of unknown heroes. They'd accomplished this by embedding several heart spears within the crystal to seal the evil away. However, many eons later, long after those said heroes had vanished, a new group arose who instead of wanting to seal the darkness, revered it and yearned for its return. One such member of this group came very close to their goal as well, succeeding in removing the heart spears trapped the darkness. The only problem was, since he didn't fully understand how to break the seal himself, the ritual went wrong, causing the Jamba Heart to explode, sending its fragments all over the galaxy, Pop Star included. So in turn, with the entire galaxy once again being at stake, Kirby set out to take action, and this time he wasn't alone. You see, in terms of Kirby games, Star Allies has honestly become the Infinity War of the series, with friends and foes from past games all coming together to help Kirby save the cosmos. And it's not like they're just shoved in to be in the game, as there's even explanations to some of the more unlikely allies coming to Kirby's aid. For Marx, as was shown in the True Arena cutscene in Superstar Ultra, he did actually manage to survive his head-on collision with Nova, only instead of taking revenge like he did in that timeline, he changed himself for the better. For Dark Meta Knight, probably the sketchiest dream friend out of them all, he's mainly just interested in the dark powers of the Jamba Heart, probably
probably due to its similarity with his lost master. For De Roach, well, he just wants to steal the Jamba hearts for himself, as he thinks they're ordinary jewels. For Taranza, sadly, he still hasn't been able to let go of Sectonia, and believes that if he goes to the altar of the Divine Terminus, he'll be able to bring her back to life. And finally, for Susie, following in her late father's footsteps, she's begun to rebuild his company, determined to continue his work of mechanizing entire planets. So okay, with the surface level stuff out of the way, let's get back to the main story. As Kirby liberated countless individuals who'd been plagued by the Jamba Hearts fragments, he'd come across a massive spaceship that recently landed on Popstar, the Jam Bastion, housing three mage sisters intent on collecting the Jamba Hearts fragments. And while Kirby would end up thwarting their plans by defeating all three of them, it wouldn't slow down their master one bit as once Kirby got to the Jam Bandra base, home to the three mage sisters and their master, it soon become pretty obvious what kind of being was sealed away within the Jamba Heart. Though by far, aside from the absolutely massive amount of lore hidden in pause screens throughout the game, much like Haltman before him, Highness, the mastermind behind the release of the Jamba Hearts, reveals an incredible amount of information solely through his quick conversation with Kirby. So for the sake of you all and so we don't jump around too much, let's start from the very beginning. As we already know, long ago there existed the Ancients, a widespread civilization responsible for a lot of the things you see in Kirby games. However, what we didn't know until now is that the Ancients were actually split into two factions, those who relied on science and machines, and those who relied on magic, with the latter also dabbling with dark matter. For a while, the two seemed to coexist with one another, with the magical Ancients even being the ones to stop a galactic crisis that threatened everything, which while not confirmed, is heavily implied to be Galactonite. Plus, this is also supported by the fact that he comes out of a portal Highness made in the what-if mode of Star Allies. Though one day, for some unknown reason, the scientific ancients decided their magical counterparts were too much of a threat and betrayed them by banishing them to the edge of the galaxy in fear of their dominion over dark matter. And it's not like the magical ancients were even remotely evil either. Just take Highness. Long before his clan was betrayed and banished, he was actually a very kind individual. For instance, when he used to travel freely across worlds, he happened upon three girls. One nearly freezing to death in a blizzard, one burning alive in an inferno, and one one being on the verge of death right after she attempted to take her own life by getting struck by lightning. In all three cases, Highness saved them, at the same time unlocking their hidden potential for certain types of magic. Though after being betrayed by the scientific ancient, his once kindly heart began to become consumed by hatred and obsession. It'd be at this point that the now insane Highness would form a religion based around dark matter believing that if he obtained and freed the being trapped within the Jamba heart, that it'd deliver him and his followers to a promised land of sorts, at the same time restoring his now shattered clan. So when Kirby finally makes it to the Divine Terminus, where Highness had been performing his ritual for who knows how long, he'd completely lost himself to the darkness within his heart, becoming the exact opposite of what he once was. Even when it came to the three sisters he'd saved eons ago, Highness in his insane state only saw them as tools to be used, becoming abusive towards them at times. Even once Highness was defeated, he'd become so obsessed with the revival of his Dark Lord that he sacrificed not only the three sisters to it, but himself, fueling the complete revival of Void Termina. Now at first, Void Termina appears to be a massive hulking titan with incredibly destructive powers. You know, what you'd expect from a destroyer of worlds. But as the fight progresses, clearly there's something more to the humanoid than meets the eye. Just take its third phase, where alongside sprouting wings that look pretty familiar, it summons a replica of the Master Crown, all but confirming Void Termina to be the force controlling the original all along. But most importantly, there's Void Termina's fourth phase, where it straight up pulls an Earthbound and copies Kirby's face. What does this mean? Well, we'll get there in a second, because alongside Kirby's face, as you progress through the fight, Void Termina confirms what the entire game had been alluding to, the fact that not only is it dark matter, but it's the source of it. Now I know I'm kind kind of encroaching on theory territory here, but hear me out, because this just lines up too perfectly. As stated in various pause screens, Void, aka Dark Matter, exists in all dimensions, accounting for instances like Dark Mind in the Mirror World, and even Dark Crafter in Kirby and the Rainbow Curse's Seventopia. 
though by far the most game-changing piece of new information expressed by these paw screens is the true nature of Dark Matter. Remember how in the Dark Matter trilogy, Zero's only real weakness was the power of positive emotions? Well, it turns out that was a lot more important than we ever realized, because in this paw screen right here, it's revealed that depending on the type of energy that's gathered, Dark Matter will not always necessarily be a force of evil, explaining how Gooey even came to be. But aside from all that, using the information we get from paw screens and the fact that Void Termina's roar is literally just a slower version of Kirby's voice, there's a pretty good chance Void Termina is actually related to Kirby, with the game heavily alluding to the fact that if Void Termina was born using purely positive energy, he could very well end up looking a lot like our titular Pink Puff rather than a dark monstrosity. And on that note, taking all of that into consideration, not only does this game pretty much spell out the origin of Dark Matter, but from the information we're given, Kirby himself may very well be the outcome of Void being birthed with pure positive energy. So there you have it, right? All of Kirby lore wrapped up nicely with an Elder God. Well, not just yet, because after Void Termina was defeated, Highness would fall into a dimensional rift, absorbing all the dark energy Void left behind and encasing himself in yet another Jamba Heart. So in turn, once Kirby releases him and defeats him in his corrupted state, the three mage sisters who've also been corrupted challenge Kirby as well, leading to him both defeating them again and purifying them with a friend heart, finally resolving the hatred that had plagued them for so long. In fact, this is honestly a pretty happy ending in Kirby terms, what with there being no dead dads and no dead crushes. Plus, in a completion picture for the mode, it seems like even Highness has finally begun returning to his old ways, relaxing with the three mage sisters on a beach. But wait just a second, since while Highness seems to have finally found peace within himself, there's one more looming entity I haven't touched on. If you thought the lore around Void Termina was convoluted, then oh boy, you haven't seen anything yet. So okay, in Star Allies, there's a what-if mode called Guest Star Allies, where it depicts what would happen if one of Kirby's friends confronted Highness instead of Kirby himself. And like always, it's only the finale itself that really has any noticeable changes, since instead of fighting Void Termina, Highness instead decides to open up an interdimensional portal, once again releasing Galactonite onto the world. Except things don't go how they usually do this time. Instead, a familiar butterfly lands on the tip of his sword, completely absorbing Galactonite's immense power and creating Morphonite, a mysterious warrior whose design actually originated from the cancelled Kirby GameCube game. So as cool and completely random as Morphonite is, let's touch on that butterfly for a second, because I'm not joking when I say it's literally been with Kirby all along. While the specific orange one has only appeared in every mainline game since Return to Dreamland, butterflies in general have been appearing alongside Kirby ever since the very first game, meaning a being capable of absorbing the actual strongest warrior in the galaxy has been with us this whole time. Now I know what you're saying, what in the actual hell is even happening anymore with Kirby lore? And honestly, for this one, I share your sentiment. As of now, Morphonite and the nature of the butterfly are mostly shrouded in mystery, with the only real information about them being the fact that the butterfly is a supposed being of paradise, and that Morphonite is associated with a judgment day of sorts, meaning Morphonite is somehow related to the Kirby afterlife? Absolutely insane, I know. So well, that's about it, or at least it is for now. To be honest, there's no telling what Hal has in store for us next. Hell, for all we know, Yin Yarn could somehow end up being the key to everything. You really never know. But anyways, ranting like a madman about Kirby lore for so long has given me an appetite. How about some strawberry shortcake? Now I know this video isn't exactly the usual kind of thing I do on my channel, but hey, please tell me if you all enjoyed it. I'd be more than happy to make more like it. I mean, hell, if you ask me, the Kirby timeline deserves an entire video on its own. And before we go, today's cool thing of the day is definitely the Kirby lore series by Wooly Versus. Because I've gotta say, if you all want a more detailed explanation of specific topics I talked about in this video with a presentation that cannot be beat, you owe it to yourselves to check out these videos. So that being said, I'm the RPG Monger, and don't forget that each and every one of you are fantastic.